but it had more to do with immunization and respiratory vulnerability like asthma. And that is still important, but this study that came out showed that obesity is actually the greatest predictor that makes people more vulnerable to having worse outcomes when they get the virus. So I wanted to mention that. And, and of course, this is something you know in, in integrative medicine that we've known for a long time. I do a lot of work with oncology and cancer patients. And uh, obesity is one of the greatest predictors for um, difficulties and uh, diagnoses associated with that, and of course with cardiovascular disease and so many other things. So this is not to this is not to judge anybody or or um, uh, put anybody on the spotlight, but just to say that one of the things we can be doing during this time where we feel so powerless and uh, having lack of control over what's going on is we can really focus on our wellness, our health, eating right, and uh, figuring out ways to uh, reduce our, our BMI or reduce our body weight if we're obese. So there are lots of people out there that are doing great coaching online. At the, at the Center for Integrative Medicine, we work on this all the time. We actually have a naturopath who specializes in it. So um, there's lots of help and support out there. I wanted to also mention just to say about testing. There's been some new, new things coming out around testing as well. And I want to start off by clarifying uh, that there are two different types of testing that we look at. One type of testing checks to see whether the virus is active in a person's body. And so usually that, uh, that test has to be done in an, from an area of the body where the virus is living. So for most, for most people, it's been a nasal swab. I had it done myself, and they stick a swab way back in, in the nose, all the way back to the, almost to the throat, and they collect a sample there. And that, then they send that test off to the lab, and it looks at whether the virus is present. Those tests are still, um, they're, they're much more accessible than they used to be, but they're still um, a bit uh, controlled, let's say. There's a new kind of test that's been released into the market recently that is, um, a, an antibody test. And that test doesn't look for the virus, it looks to see whether or not the body has produced antibodies to the virus. And why is that important? Well, that's important because it tells us whether we have seen, our body has seen the virus before. It's a kind of memory our body has to uh, recognize the virus for the future. It's kind of similar to what we do um, with, uh, there's lots of different types of antibody tests that we look at to see if someone has been exposed to a certain virus or, um, for example. So the antibody tests have, are getting much more popular, but at the Center for Integrative Medicine, we have decided to hold our horses and really get a look at what's out there and, and what these tests are um, showing us. For, for, first of all, the antibody tests don't necessarily tell us whether the person can get the virus again. They're, they're, it's unclear at this point whether having had the virus in the past protects a person from contracting it in. So just because an antibody test comes back positive, it doesn't necessarily mean the person can't get the virus again. And until we know that for sure, we don't really understand the value of getting an antibody test. Um, and so, you know, those are the two types of tests, and um, they're both, you know, becoming available, and what we need is for them to get much more accessible. There is another virus test. I had mentioned the one that goes back in the, the, the nose. There's another virus test that's just right now getting ready to come out where we'll be able to do a home collection of saliva and send it off to the lab, and they'll be able to look and see whether there's virus present. And that's a virus test. So that's another test to look out for. And of course, we'll be keeping up on all of that and we'll let everybody know when is the right time to really start incorporating that testing into you know, our stay at home lives. Um, so I also wanted to uh, say that, let's see, what else did I wanna mention? I think that's everything I want to talk about for that. I just have a couple of minutes left. So I'm very quickly going to tell you about um, a naturopathic treatment that's called a warm treatment. And the reason this is important to you and I'm showing you, you can see the handout that we're going to give uh, in our follow-up. Um, 
So this tan soap will also have some of the warming socks treatment. And the warming socks treatment is an old naturopathic treatment that is used when someone has low-grade fever. And this is something that is great to do if you have a little bit of a fever and it helps your body to mount a response and get through the fever quickly. So this isn't something that you would use if, if a person was having an extremely high fever or if they were having breathing problems. Of course, then you would get acute medical help. But this is something that you can do on your own at home to try to push the body to respond to the fever and get through it more quickly. So the warming sock treatment, just put very quickly, is you take a, cotton, a pair of cotton socks and a pair of wool socks. You get the cotton socks wet, you put them on your feet, then you put the wool socks on top and you go to bed. And the, the, there's a wicking action that happens that creates a circulation of the capillaries in the feet, which then has a, an indirect effect all the way up into the circulatory system. It creates a kind of a pump. So the, the coldness of the socks constricts the capillaries and then the, the wool wicks off the moisture, the socks warm up, and then it dilates the capillaries. So you get constriction, dilation, constriction, dilation, and that pushes the blood through the body and around the body, which allows the immune system to circulate really beautifully during a fever process and get rid of any of the byproducts of the fever and help the body to deal with it. So there's a few little more details about this warming sock treatment. It's one of my favorite naturopathic treatments. We're going to do the handout for it, but because time is short, I'm going to stop there. Um, I know that there are probably a few questions. I'm going to ask you how much time we have for questions so that I don't take up too much time. Uh, so does anybody have any questions for Dr. Deirdre? You can unmute yourself and ask. I have a question. Um, since the original genome from the very first cases of COVID-19 have never been released by the Chinese, the testing that we're doing was never based on the original genome. So how do we know that we're identifying COVID-19 per se, and maybe not some other viruses that are creating, giving off exomes and everybody has viruses in their bodies? Did I can answer, help you if you need it? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say that's a that's a virology immunology question. I don't know the details on it. Um, so go ahead, Misha. Yeah, and actually, they did release the uh, DNA to the WHO within two weeks after the infection. So we actually are using correct technology. The PCR pieces are correct, and they've been validated both by WHO and FDA. Thanks, Linda. Oh, you can also type your questions in the um, chat. in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions coming through the chat, so okay. I'd like to turn things over to Luann. Okay, great. I think we'll have a few minutes at the very end for questions as well, so um, yes. we can do it then. All right, Luann. Hi, everyone. Today we're going to do what I call trauma relief protocol. This I'm going to do it guided with you, but this can also be done as a self-empowerment meditation, and we have a handout for you on this, too. Um, as we begin, though, let's just describe what mind-body practices are. They engage our thoughts, our emotions, our sensations, and our breath grounded in the body, for the purpose of relieving stress and improving health and well-being. In all my years of using Reiki and biofeedback, I have discovered that touch is biofeedback for the body. That when we add touch into our other mindful practices, the benefit to you exponentially increases. With this physical isolating that we are using as a prevention for COVID spreading, many are also touch deprived. No hugs from kids to grandparents, for instance. And we are even now becoming to associate touching with the possibility of spreading the virus. But today we're gonna to learn self-care touch 
um, with this meditation, and the purpose really is to enhance the immune system. Remember, your immune system is located all over your body. It's not in one location. So um, we're going to begin our meditation with breathing first, and then we're going to move into investigating what we're holding on to, and then we'll move into treating it with positive affirmations for ourselves. So first thing is to make yourself comfortable. If you feel like lying down and you're able to do that, that's fine. If you would like to sit, or even if you've um, later on sometime, if you've been working at the computer all day and you want to stand up and take a rest, you can do this in a standing position also. First, we want to bring in breath. So we're going to do nine breaths. The first three, we're going to focus on just connecting to the physical body. I'm going to do this in silence. I breathe kind of slowly, so I'm going to watch the clock and make sure I don't get into too deep a breathing. And then I'll cue you each time we're going to shift in the breath. So let's start with the physical body. really noticing what you're sensing and feeling. Next, we're going to breathe into our emotional and mental body. And the last three breaths, we're going to focus on our spiritual body. Take a moment to just notice if anything is upsetting you today, if you noticed any tension anywhere where you were holding on. And if you want, you can even rate yourself zero to 10, zero being the least tension, 10 being the most. And then we're going to begin going through 13 points through our body. And I'm going to give you some examples of where you're to place your hands. We're going to use one hand as a stationary or anchoring hand. And so, for instance, if you're experiencing anger or resentment, you would place that hand on solar plexus. That's the soft part of your upper belly, beneath the ribs, and above the navel. If, for in instance, you're experiencing sadness or fear or grief, you would place that stationary hand over the heart. And our other hand, it doesn't matter which one you use for which, our other hand is going to be called the treating hand. And we're going to go through 13 points on our body. Identifying what's bothering you, placing your hand on your body. If you're not sure where to place it, place it anywhere that's comfortable for you. For instance, I've had a cold for six weeks. I'm finally getting over it, but I'm actually going to treat my throat today because it's the area where I'm holding up some kind of stuff there. I want you to think now of a short healing phrase. This is what you're going to, this phrase and this 
treatment hand or what you're going to use as your treatment. Some examples might be, I am calm, I am love, I am peace, I am safe, I am here now, I am connected, I am compassionate, I am courageous, I am powerful. You can use any phrase you like. You can use a single word if that's easier. Make it short and make it relevant to you at this moment. And if I also might suggest whatever arises for you, stick with it. Stick with that phrase. The mind likes to suggest other things to you as you're going along, tries to improve what you're doing, but just stick with your intuitive for right now. And so we're going to begin. We have our healing phrase or statement or word. And the first place we're going to use the treatment hand is on the crown, on the top of our heads. So breathing in, breathing out, and repeating your healing statement. We're going to remain here for a full minute. Moving your hand now to the brow and repeating your healing statement as you breathe. Now to the chin, repeating your healing statement and breathing. Now to the throat. So now my treating hand and my stationary hand are together.
And now we move to the heart, repeating your statement, breathing into the heart. Now we're going three inches to the left of the heart, to the left lung area. And now we move three inches to the right of the heart, to the right lung. Now moving to solar plexus, which is the belly underneath the ribs, but above the belly button or the navel. Repeating your healing state and breathing. And now the hand moves below the navel, above the pubic bone, into the soft pelvis, low belly. Repeating your healing statement, breathing, 
deep into the body. Move your hand now to the juncture point of the left leg and the torso called the left crease, groin crease. Breathing in and out, repeating your healing statement. Moving your treating hand to the right leg where it joins the torso, the right groin crease. Repeat your healing statement and breathe. And now we're going to move our hand, our treating hand, to the base of the spine. We describe this as between the sit bones. So you may have to raise up to get your hand there. Between the perineum, or on the perineum, between the anus and the genitals. Healing statement. Breathing into this base of the spine. Now breathing in and breathing out, we bring our two hands together in front of our hearts, grateful that we've had this practice together today, even though we are separated physically, 
We are not separated socially, emotionally, spiritually. And let me leave you with these three things. When we de-stress, we improve the ability of our immune systems to function. So while we don't have a treatment yet for this virus, we do have options to help ourselves. De-stressing is a main one. These mind-body practices empower you to reduce stress. And self-care touch balances the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, and with practice over time, the digestive and endocrine system. And as we end today, may this practice, our practice together, be a blessing for each of you, and may it be a benefit to all sentient beings today. Thank you. Thank you, Luann, that was wonderful. Does anybody have any questions before we wrap up for the day? You can unmute yourself and ask. Hi, my name is Nicole, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, it's Nicole Broody, and um, I had the pleasure of being a patient with Dr. Sear and Lou Ann. I don't know if you remember me. It's been a few years, um, and it's okay if you hi, remember Nicole. me. I'm just saying hi. Hi, um, hi Nicole. Hi. Hi, Nicole. Hi. So my question with Dr. Sear, you were talking about the antibody test, and right in the beginning when you were describing what it was, I, the phone kind of like had a funny sound, and I, and I missed a key part, so I don't think I yeah. fully understand. I got a whole bunch of um, chats that my sound is going in and out, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I was trying to explain that there are two different types of testing that are being discussed right now. The first type looks to see whether the antibody, I mean, I'm sorry, whether the virus is, is active in the person's body, and that means we have the infection. And that's the one where they put the swab down the nose, and then more recently, there's uh, an at-home collection test that uses spit to look for the virus. And that isn't available yet, but it hopefully will be available soon so that we can stay at home and get tested whether or not we have the virus. There's another kind of test that's different and that's called an antibody test. And the antibody <laughs> test looks at whether our body has ever seen the virus before. So I might've gotten gotten the virus, say, a couple months ago, and I may not have any more viruses in my body, but if you look at my immune system, I will have an antibody to the virus, and it's a very unique, specific antibody, and so that's what that test looks for, and that sounds great because then it would, then it would mean, oh, wow, okay, I've had, the, I've had the antibody, I mean, I've had the virus already, I'm over it, I can go out, I can go to the grocery store, I don't have to worry about getting infected. However, um, this virus is a little bit, um, we don't understand it fully yet. So we don't know for sure that having had the virus before means that we will be immune now. And so the antibody is interesting, but it's not clinically useful yet until we really know what that means if we have mm -hmm. an antibody. Does that answer the question, Nicole? It does, thank you. You're very welcome. So there was a question um, before we didn't address it. We moved to the practice. Um, the question was, let me get to it real quick. Um, Is it about going jogging and aerosol versus? Yeah, so yeah, the question was, uh, what do you think about the concept of it being aerosol airborne and is it safe to run? So, so I don't know, Deidre, do you wanna say that? Or you want me to comment on that? Oh, well, I'll say, I'll say what I think. I think running and exercise are critical and we have to get exercise. We don't know yet how much the virus is, we don't completely understand how aerosolized it is, but the odds of going jogging and running through somewhere that someone just coughed and getting the virus is very, very low. However, if you're going running in a park where there's three people on your right and three people passing you on, on the other side and 
there's people in front of you and people behind you and it ends up being a kind of crowded situation, the risk is escalating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very, very correct. Um, I think the safest thing to run outside is in relatively um, non-crowd areas so you don't pass close to anybody else. Um, I don't think that my father told me that he, uh, you know, he's a runner, he runs about you know, anywhere from 40 to 150 miles per week. Um, and, you know, he said it's, it's kind of hard to um, find the paths with no people. He tried to run with a mask and, and he really couldn't because it was interfering with breathing. So I'm, I'm guessing I have seen people running with the masks along the Rock Creek path. Um, so somebody's trying to do that. I probably wouldn't recommend that. It's probably quite difficult to do. Um, and, you know, your choices then are very least crowded areas or treadmill at home. Uh, someone else asked me, haven't people with the antibodies become reinfected and isn't there a 30-day infection that is detected from the gut and the feces? And so what I want to say about that is there's, there's a few different things going on. There's an active infection, there's antibodies, and then there's also viral shedding, which means our body is still giving off the virus and we can find it in the body, but we may or may not be infect, uh, contagious. So... Um, there have been there have been cases noted where people have gotten the antibodies and and have been tested negative for the virus they get released from the hospital or from quarantine and then they get tested positive again later but no one really knows whether it's a true whether the virus was truly out of their body and then they were reinfected or whether they actually um their viral shedding decreased enough that it was undetectable on the testing and then it ramped up again. So it was the same infection. So those are two different things. And as far as I know, Misha, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that, there, that we know for sure the behavior of this virus and, and the course of the infection as far as that goes. Yeah, that's, I completely agree with that. Uh, I, I, the, the, the criticality of antibody tests, even though we really can't clinically use it at this point at all, is that it, it must occur for the vaccine development. There's no capacity to develop vaccine without this test. Because if you can't prove efficacy of the vaccine with antibodies, you don't have a vaccine. It doesn't matter what. And so, and that's one of the really substantial concerns at the moment that we will not have vaccine what's at all. Not only not soon, but not at all is because the, this test is apparently uh, extremely tricky to appropriately develop. The current FDA approved test, the first one was at Stanford, um, and supposedly it's already offered in some parts of the country in California, but I don't know the details of it, and there's been very serious concerns raised about this test. So as uh, Dr. Sir correctly stated at CIM, we decided to kind of wait and see where the science goes and be guided by the FDA and CDC on this matter because the, we've been approached by multiple companies, I think three or four, that offering non-FDA approved tests uh, of antibodies. And we have uh, decided that, that it's just simply not yet appropriate to give them to patients because we don't know what actions we will take based on either positive or negative result. So someone Misha, named... we have we have two more. Misha Deirdre, we have two more mm -hmm. questions and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Um, I want to comment on something that Jennifer posted, which is would you comment on the newer theories that the virus may not specifically target respiratory system, but targets some kind of oxygen delivery system that can affect many organs? So as far as the oxygen delivery system goes, I think that's um, that's so what I will say is that we know that the virus um, enters the cell through the ACE receptors, um, angiotensin converting enzyme receptors. And the respiratory tract is what people tend to think of primarily about ACE receptors. However, there are ACE receptors in the gut, and now we're seeing a lot of gut symptoms with the virus, and that's probably because the virus is attaching to ACE receptors in the gut. And that's why there's also some shedding through the stool. And so, you know, you think of conditions like maybe hepatitis or something where people get it because of oral fecal contamination, like you, you don't wash your hands well enough after uh, wiping. That, um, 
That is also possible with this virus. So as far as the oxygen delivery system goes, I think that's more you're talking about like um, intracellular pathways that have to do with the, um, the uh, health of the cell and how the inflammatory process happens. And that's, that's a whole different thing um, that we don't have time to get into here. Uh, yeah, so that well, I, I would add that, Jennifer, that's actually a relevant theory, and I've read it, and I actually think there's not just validity to it, but it's probably a correct theory, because as you know, uh, there's a very big concern that ventilators do absolutely nothing for this condition. In fact, they may increase mortality, not decrease it. Um, I don't think Deidre, Dr. Sarah and I have sophisticated enough on this standing of molecular pathways here to give you more answer, but it's a critical question that unfortunately I'm afraid is correct in the assumption underneath the question, making the treatments, uh, treatments a lot more tricky overall. Um, so, but I want to address the next question because it's, uh, first of all, Mavis, thank you so much for sharing this difficult news with us. Just want to take a second to, um, you know, uh, honor your father's life and um, just a second of a silence. And, you know, your question is, um, you know, so it's a good question. I mean, what is the common symptoms? You know, the common symptoms thought to be, of course, fever, respiratory symptoms, but a lot of people also develop um, flu-like symptoms with headaches, with uh, myalgias or muscle pains. And there's also uh, quite a lot of uh, frequent intestinal symptoms, diarrhea, um, primarily the primary one. So I would look for those symptoms, um, but it's probably also very likely if you did get infected, you're gonna have a silent infection. In fact, we think that by far majority of people who are exposed and become um, what can be called as carriers, I guess, or that you've simply had the disease, but without any symptoms whatsoever. And some people think that that's actually by far more than 90% of people who um, experience no symptoms at all, even though they now have been exposed and passed through the virus. I would like to ask a question. Okay, one last question. Before you leave. Hi, Dr. Kogan. This is Claudette. Hi, Claudette. How are you? Um, about two weeks or so before the um, COVID-19 broke on everyone, I was sick. And I had most of the symptoms mm -hmm. um, except the fever, but I had everything else. And I'm wondering if that is what I was. The, the, when I went to the hospital, they said it was bronchial pneumonia. Mm -hmm. um, but now after COVID came and everyone's talking about it and stuff, I'm wondering if that was not what I had. Because as I said, I had everything else, the diarrhea, the terrible headaches, um, the shortness of breath and all of that. But I came through mine, thank God I came through mine. But I'm wondering if I should take the test to see if that is what I had or if I'm still a, a carrier or... Right, 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 right. You are the absolutely perfect patient who should get this antibody test as soon as it's FDA approved and available. Okay. Um, however, the problem again right now in our area, we simply don't have that. And I would absolutely not advise you to get non-FDA approved tests right now because we simply don't know their validity. So that's a quick answer. We forgot one question um, and uh, from Barbara Margenfeld. If a member of our family had to go to the hospital overnight, do they need to be quarantined? Okay, that's a, that's a dif difficult question to answer well. Um, I'm assuming they got tested in the hospital. Uh, Barbara, if you feel like unmuting yourself and commenting on that, that'd probably be useful. They said that he did not have COVID and he was in the cardiac area. He was totally away from the, um, right, right. any of the COVID so, people. Right, the, the reason it's a difficult question is because of course at the hospital, 
uh, it's much higher risk for him to being exposed, no matter how clean they keep the emergency room. So um, I would probably do the following. I would um, probably actually quarantine him inside your house as much as you can away from the rest of the family members for seven days. Uh, just because he was highly, he was exposed at relatively high risk, especially if he stayed there for quite a while. Um, and, you know, obviously if they tell him that he's positive, that changes everything, of course. But, you know, I'm assuming they tested him or they didn't have a reason to test him, but it's just an exposure in emergency room. And that's also the reason why right now, unless you have absolutely true emergency, you shouldn't go for minor symptoms to the hospital or even urgent care because your risk of expo being exposed there is substantially higher than at home or on a street close to you or even in a store. Yeah, he was in a completely different emergency room, I guess, yeah. separate from the yeah. COVID, but still. Yeah, I don't actually, to be honest with you, I don't have a great answer to this because part of me wants to say it's not that much higher risk than him going to say any other healthcare facility, a laboratory, or even a busy supermarket. But at the same time, it is emergency room, so you simply can't control what's happening there. So risk is high. Right, okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Now, before I sign off, I'm going to uh, give you all a, a tip that I learned uh, last week from a wonderful podcast I listened to called Science Versus. It's actually the word science and then VS. Um, after you use your, uh, go to the bathroom, close the toilet lid and then flush. <laughs> because we do know that there's a, a, a fecal aspect. Um, Misha, I don't know if you saw the, the paper about it out of China, about yeah, GI yeah. problems. Yeah, well, and I've heard uh, somebody I trust saying that in our area, in DMV area, the GI symptoms were significantly higher prevalent than in the rest of the country. I don't know if there's been study confirming that, uh, you know, but I have had a number of patients who came with uh, fevers and myalgias and GI symptoms and unfortunately the problem is that we don't know that for sure whether that's a positive or not because we don't have a stool test that's adequately can assess the situation and doing the nasal swab would be useless since the, that's not the area where the virus is in that person. So once again, as with many of the things we're now doing for safety reasons, um, just close the lid because when you do flush, there is sort of a plume <laughs> sort of similar to what happens when you sneeze, but smaller, mm. that happens. So please be kind to yourselves. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. See you next Friday. Thank you.